So as Adam said, my name is Asa Kasuma. I'm from LinkedIn. And today I just want to talk about a few ways you can become a control freak in a good way with a couple of tools, including promises and controllers. Uh, yeah, so say I work at LinkedIn. I'm a mobile web developer. Um, outside of web development, I'm an avid mountain biker and supporter. Um, so yeah, I, I've been at LinkedIn for about almost a year now. Uh, I graduated from school a little over a year ago. So these are uh, probably my favorite photo of me writing JavaScript. You can see I've been doing it for quite some time now. <laughs> so yeah, let's talk about mobile web and LinkedIn. So in 2011, we launched a, it wasn't our first mobile web experience, but it was the first backbone app that LinkedIn had in production. And then about a year later in 2012, we decided, hey, we want to give our backbone app a facelift. So, you know, we just want to change the views and change how the app feels, so that should be easy, right? Uh, unfortunately, that was not exactly the case. And so today I want to talk a little bit uh, about the learnings we had from refactoring our mobile web experience. So after uh, we launched this new mobile web experience, we kind of got in a room together and said, okay, what can we do to improve the infrastructure of our um, a development environment and how we can improve writing code and how can we make our site faster? So we want to just improve our site, not thinking anything about the products, but just about um, improving the technology. So we formed this team, we call it Team Austin, and our slogan was uh, the Wild West, Wild West Refined. So what we kind of like to characterize our situation was, was we had a, a Wild West in our hands. So we expanded really fast, we launched some really cool products, but we needed to step back and kind of bring some infrastructure to the website that we had built. So a couple of things that characterize what we call this Wild West. So Brian did a really awesome job of talking, I think yesterday, about uh, controllers and routers. Um, and so one of the things he talked about, which I wanted to echo, was this concept of, of routers being super bloated if you don't kind of properly uh, funnel code around. <coughs> and so this is a picture of what our router, one of our routers looked like. Uh, this is actually after a major refactor. So you can see uh, we had actually implemented AMD at this point. And there's a big AMD call at the beginning. Um, but it was just like this huge, super huge, unwieldy thing, and it wasn't very fun to work with. Another thing we found was that our control flow uh, was less than ideal. So we would often have two asynchronous operations that had nothing to do with each other, besides the fact that after they were both done, we needed to do something else. Um, and so instead of doing this in parallel, we would often do this um, in series, which is not good. Um, and then, Another thing we thought we had was we didn't really have that much abstraction, um, and so we would have views where we were doing data manipulation and also caching. So if you wanted to change some visual components, you also had to know about our caching layer, which was also not a good thing. So uh, two things: one, um, you know, we're actively taming our Wild West, so uh, we're not done yet; we're in the process. And so today, I just want to share with you a few of the things that we're actively working on. Uh, some of the, some of which are in production some of which are not. The other thing is that we are actively optimizing for our mobile web. So we have some other backbone stacks on our site. Um, I'm not going to be talking about those. I'll be mostly focusing on uh, mobile. So we have a feeling that we aren't the only ones for both of these things um, with respect to both uh, developing for mobile and with respect to uh, actively improving our backbone experience. So promises. At the heart of promises is we're talking mostly about ways of simplifying and abstracting um, asynchronous backbone. And so the main concept here is that we want to um, create some kind of object that we can use to, um, given an operation that promises a future result, um, have a handle that operation. And so like I said, the heart of this is abstraction. So abstractions are easier to control, and this is kind of the theme of this talk, <coughs> way easier to wheel. So, Promises basically allow us to reason and think and manipulate asynchronous operations in a synchronous manner. And this is huge for readability and maintainability. So a couple details about promises. So there are lots of ways you can implement promises. I'm going to be talking today mostly about the A plus spec, which is a set API for interacting with promises. There are lots of libraries that implement the A plus spec. I'm going to be talking mostly about Q today because that's what we use, but you can use any promise library like when. I think it's what the uses. And then the main 
point, uh, our main API to a promise is the then function. Mm -hmm. So uh, the then function allows you to attach a handler to your promise object. So the cool thing about our promises is that Backbone and jQuery already <laughs> use them. So any, or I think believe most Backbone asynchronous operations return a promise that you can use, as do um, many jQuery asynchronous operations. So they return uh, a JQ XHR, which is a promise object that typically represents an XHR operation. So why are promises cool? Um, promises are cool because if you have, let's say, a, a callback chain, you can easily string them together in a more uh, readable fashion. So here we have, a, a, say, three operations we want to do in series. Typically, we'd have a callback chain. Uh, but instead, we can flatten that into one line at the bottom. So it's pretty nice to work with. So uh, as I kind of mentioned earlier, we had this issue where we would have uh, two operations that really could be done in parallel. And instead, were done in series. Um, and so typically, if you want to make your code more efficient, a lot of times you have to add more complexity to your code. And so we had both complex code and inefficiency, which was definitely not good. So this is an actual chunk of code from our repo um, about probably six months ago. So it changed some of the names, but I mean, this is actual code as in production. Uh, so if you see, there's three callbacks. So first we do a page animation, slides the page over, then we go fetch some data, and then we actually display that data. So we can actually do this page or data fetching and animation at the same time. And so this is kind of what this looks like after. So uh, we use Q, but you can use any promise library. Most promise libraries have an all function, which takes two promises and it kind of merges them. So it returns a promise that will be completed when both promises resolve. So we modify the show page function to return a promise. And then like I said earlier, uh, fetching, background fetching by default returns a promise. So you pipe those two in and you get out a new promise, which you can attach a handler callback to. So notice, right now I'm using an anonymous function as a callback, that's for readability sake for the presentation. In real life, you would want to use a member function, so it's way more, way more readable and you can actually test it. So that last slide, uh, we discovered it makes it a lot easier if you put that in a controller. Um, it's uh, like Brian described earlier, controllers are pretty awesome. And uh, we kind of went back to this, this idea of putting the C back in MVC and uh, using controllers. So Backbone is not a framework. Um, I think we've talked a lot about that. And it's really a library for building a framework. So the cool thing about Backbone is it gives you, the developer, lots of power. And with that power comes responsibility. And that responsibility is to build the framework that you want to use. And we found out that if, if you don't really build that framework that each developer kind of builds his own framework, which can be a problem when you have lots of developers working on the same Backbone app. So one of my favorite concepts that Nick Zakis talks about is this concept that everything should have a specific spot to belong. And kind of the concept of if you're building something and you don't know where it belongs, that probably means you either need a new component or you need better documentation. So it's this issue of, oh, where does this belong, really it should not pop up. So why the controller? First, MVC is pretty well known. Uh, lots of people have used Ruby on Rails or old PHP frameworks. Um, I first learned MVC on a, on a PHP framework. Kind of one distinction that um, you know, at least tripped up myself was uh, when you learn MVC on the server side, controllers are a little bit different because the controllers are pretty much dead once the HTTP request is served up. And so they don't really have an extended life cycle, whereas on the client, you really have to worry about that. Um, as Brian talked about, and actually a lot of other people talked about, uh, router controllers are really useful for draining your routers. So if your routers are bloated like ours were, it's really nice to move a lot of that code into the controller. And then it also reduces uh, points of contact. So um, your router has less dependencies, and then your controller has less dependencies because you split them out more. And that also helps with testing a lot because our router tests were ginormous before because we would have to pull in so many dependencies. <laughs> The other thing we did was uh, we built this somewhat specialized concept called the page controller, which does exactly what you think it does. It 
represents basically a screen on a mobile app, and we found that concept was super helpful. So one thing to, to talk about is uh, controllers are finite. So uh, there's another guy I work with LinkedIn who's really big on uh, calling controllers operations and not controllers, because a lot of times he feels like people don't remember that it's a finite process. So controllers start up and they can be killed in the future. And I'll talk a little bit this more later, but uh, it's really important on a mobile device to conserve memory. And so we definitely had to make a lot of use of stopping um, controllers. So if we had some polling going on and within the <coughs> controller, and we wanted to hide that controller, we needed to make sure that we could pause it so we could stop any polling that was going on since the HTTP requests are so expensive. And like views, you can unbind them and destroy them, um, which so just like you would clean up a view, you could clean up a controller. It's another important concept for controllers is this idea that your components should be monogamous. And what I mean by that is you should try to have each component only interact with one layer at a time, one app layer. So kind of the same uh, principle um, as separation of concerns. So uh, kind of an extension that is kind of the layer principle. So this is a diagram of what uh, the flow uh, that you might use in an app. So if you have a view that has a form, user clicks on the form to submit it, uh, that event gets bubbled up to the controller. We also sometimes use event delegation. So Instead of a bubbling event, we actually have a reference to the parent controller, and we call the parent controller directly. So you can do that as well, depending on what you prefer. And then the controller, we do have a generic method that handles actions from the view. So I think someone talked a bit earlier about data binding being from hell. Uh, we actually experienced some data binding or model binding issues where uh, we would have a model that was passed around to a bunch of different views and controllers. And some controller view would trigger an event and an unexpected side effect would happen in another component. And so one way to get around this is uh, we would kind of proxy a v uh, an event to one object. So there would only be one event, only one object is listening. And then we use this like create record, create record function kind of as a hook. So if you want to add anything else to what happens when on save click has happened, you put that functionality in create record. So it's a little more readable, and you don't have to go looking around for what, where a model is bound. <coughs> and then the, the controller would call save record on the model, and then the model has some is valid function or any other data functions you might have. Then we start the process back when we go back up or down this diagram. So we have a promise resolves the asynchronous operation to fetch the model. The controller has a, a handler to the promise and uh, calls process new record. And then process new record is that kind of generic method uh, from coming back up the chain that you can use to write any hooks for. And then the controller then calls a view, and notice you know, the view does, then does the um, thumb manipulation. So one important thing to note is that each layer has its own distinct vernacular, and we, we want to use that vernacular whenever writing or naming functions. So you know, we don't want to be talking about the DOM as much in the controller, and that way it's kind of easier to, to, to read components as you're going through. The other thing that controllers really help us with is uh, we call sane routing. So you're not pulling your hair out trying to get your app to route the way you want. And then one other thing we did was some of our routers, instead of just calling a simple callback function, um, you can set up a hook function. So this example we have uh, we have two routes. We have a, a, a post reading route, and you can actually also write to that post. And so the write, anybody can go read a post, but not everybody can write a post, so you have to be the owner of that post. And so we wanted to make authentication really easy. So you can write a hook that returns a promise. So if the promise resolves, the router allows the app to continue onto that page. And if the router is, or excuse me, if the promise is rejected, you're not allowed to go do that. So that way it's super easy to um, set up authentication. We actually had this issue where we didn't really set a set way to do authentication. And so we had like four or five different ways to authenticate a page, which is really bad because anytime we wanted to add code, it was really hard. So this is how we actually implemented um, what I just talked about. So here's again our route hash. And uh, we had this contract of an application, which a lot of people also talked about earlier. Same deal, you have one overarching object that controls the application. So when you create your application, you create a router. And 
One thing you can do is pass in, we call a, a proxy router function to the router. And what this is, is it's a single point of entry to a route change. So anytime a route is changed, and if there's you know, if it's a authentication hook, if the promise is resolved, you'll call this router proxy function. So the app knows anytime you change the page. So you pass in the action, so if we went to read, read would be the action variable, and then it would pass in the first parameter. So in this case, ID is what you write. And then it would find the page controller and fire up that controller and show the page. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention, one other cool thing this does is uh, if you want to uh, have your router available on the back end, like in a node process, it's way easier to, like, say, eval that on the server if your routers are small and only care about routing. Um, so we talked about controllers, but really the main point we want to get across is that you really need to expand your component toolbox to what fits you. So we've also added several other components, like a view model, which I'll talk about in a second. We also have a router map, which is essentially just the router hash. So that way it's just a JSON object, and it's super easy to include that in your node instance. We also have a data store, which is a lot like uh, what Bob Holt talked about, kind of a combination of a repository and a factory. So it's, it's a model factory, um, all the models reference it, and it's, it's kind of what we use to override backbone.sync and it has our caching layer, all that jazz, so it's kind of a, a separate uh, data layer. Then we also have page controllers, which I talked about earlier, and kind of the cool thing about page controllers is if you have, if you're using AMD or any other modular system, and you're using page controllers, you immediately have a dependency graph of every page. So if you want to build a, a bundle per page, that's super easy to do. So let's talk about a little about view models. We mentioned them a few times. And this is how we implemented them. So we first we have our data store, which has a, a model factory function, uh, get user. So get the current user. And then the callback to data is on data. So on data is kind of a generic term for whenever we have the data that we need. We get the user model, and we take the output of the two JSON function and shove that into the user view model. And then we pass that view model to the view. Now in the view, um, this is how we use it, but in, in the model we have this, this idea of an exports array, and the exports array is what gets passed to the view. So someone earlier talked about essentially extracting your logic from your template and into your model, and this is super helpful. One, because it's way easier to test your models than it is the output of your DOM, and then two, because it gives you a layer of abstraction. and. Like I talked about earlier, if you have a model that's passed into a view, if that model is also passed other places and you're bonding to that model, uh, any component that has that model suddenly has an API to your view. And so you run these encapsulation problems where views can change other views unexpectedly. And so one thing we don't do is there are no events on view models. It's just a facade to the model and it's, it's really dumb, which is so we have an exports array. We call this, this example is called full name. So when the view model calls this two exports function and builds an exports object, what it does is it goes to the exports array and says, okay, is full name an attribute on my model? If it's not, it looks for a function called full name. If it does, it just returns whatever that returns. So um, this is a good example for how you might put your template logic into a model. So if the language is Japanese, we want to put the last name first. And so we put that object or that, that logic in the model, in the view model. Um, and, th and that way, if you have one model that represents a user, you might have views that don't necessarily need to do this. And so you decouple your view logic from the pure data logic. So I talked a little about mobile constraints kind of some pretty standard ones that we had to, to think about when building our component toolbox. Um, memory and uh, CPU power was a big one. We, we ran into uh, lots of issues with that. Um, we had some, some crashing issues, um, perhaps kind of big. We also have you know, less green space. Now this can be a, a good thing or a bad thing depending on how you look at it. So it's, it's nice because you don't have to have too many DOM objects available at once. Uh, but it also has some product concerns. And the other big thing is requests are way more expensive. So 
be very careful about how many requests you make and how big those requests are. So we actually have started doing this thing where in order to speed up our page, what we'll do is we'll, we'll create, I talked about this earlier, we'll create a, a page bundle, which is based on the page controller. And so what that is, is that's all the JavaScript you need for that one page. And where this comes in handy is, as I'm sure you all know, LinkedIn sends a lot of email. So send out email, uh, people will get the email, and on their mobile device, and they click the email. And right now, or in, in a lot of cases, when you click the email, you have to load the entire site to view that one invitation or see that one profile. So you have to download over half a meg of CSS and even more JavaScript just to see one little page. So what we're doing is we, on the first request, you just load just the JavaScript you need and just the CSS. Well, sort of. We're actually working on the CSS fancy problem. Um, if you have any ideas on that, come talk to me after. But yeah, so that speeds up the site a lot. It means your requests are a lot smaller. Uh, super helpful, and it's really helping our balance rate because you know if you just want to see a connection, you don't have to wait like five seconds to see a connection. So I want to talk about just a few general concepts that we learned while refactoring our app. Um, be a little more general here. Kind of like the overarching one of the overarching principles we learned was that. If you want your code base to be unified, you really have to be a control freak. Uh, we, one, one small thing we did was uh, in our, our code base ones it wasn't hinted, um, and so we implemented JSON. Now, if you already have a humongous JavaScript code base, uh, and this was across the company, this is not just mobile. If you have a humongous code base, this can be super problematic. Like some did not go over well with some people. I mean, you don't you don't want to refactor like all your code for a hint, uh, but the output was awesome in that all our code looked the same. And so yeah, it's not always going to go over well with everyone, but it's usually worth it in the long run. And another way that's really good for kind of keeping control over your code base is to set up extension. So people are going to extend your code whether you like it or not. And if you don't have a set way for people to extend your code, they will extend it in whatever way they see fit which can be problematic when you have a lot of developers. So you know, there are lots of great ways to do the same thing. And we definitely want to encourage people to always have a conversation about the best way to do something. But we want that conversation to happen at the beginning before we actually build the app. So like I said earlier, we had like five different ways of authenticating a page, which is really problematic. So a couple ways you can do that. Um, we talked a lot about using mix-ins. Um, I'm not going to go too much into that, but basically it's way better than multiple or having a huge inheritance tree. Really easy way to do multiple inheritance. We also had this issue where we had lots of uh, member functions that really should have been just helpers, uh, like static functions. So I'm not like a super big fan of the way back when does static functions. So we just have these little AMD modules, which are just object literals that have functions on them. And instead of attaching or mixing them into the class, we just add them as an AMD dependency and use them on the fly. So we have a lot of like little view helpers that just do basic DOM manipulation stuff the same way over and over. Uh, do the animation that's helpful. Um, you know, there are tons of backbone extensions are on the web and like pretty much all of them that <coughs> interact with views have like a pre and post render function. And there's a reason for that because lots of people want to do things before or after you render. So uh, simple functions like that are good to add wherever you think someone might extend your function or extend an operation. So yeah, routing, rendering, two things everyone does, good to have those around. Another thing we learned is that big things are hard to control. So if you have monolithic anything, it's really hard to get that to do what you want from both a, a runtime perspective and from a how you want things to develop perspective. So if you have something big, it's often hard to get the code the way you want it. Um, we have people manipulating that huge monolithic thing in several different ways. So one practical thing we have been doing is we focused on making small, unintrusive changes. And so I, I have some, some, en some engineering friends that aren't in software engineering, they're in mechanical or civil engineering. And they always talk about how software engineers can cheat because they can just merge and not have to worry about the consequences of what they're changing. Whereas if you're building a bridge, you can't necessarily just shut the bridge down to do any modifications. And so we kind of tried to embrace this concept of trying not to shut down anything or merge or branch. 
So we're on a, a single branch system at, at LinkedIn, so we don't do branches or feature branches or merges. We found that merging was super painful for huge projects and also we're like really slow. So you know, if we're working on a code base where like hundreds of people are looking at it, it's just too hard to keep track of all the branches. So one thing we had to do was modify in place. So we have small feature flags. Uh, we try to make changes as incremental as possible. And this is super helpful for uh, making sure our goal doesn't go down. The other thing we do is we have, we call, or, it's, or we didn't come up with this, but it's called a, a train release model. So your release schedule is like a train. So the train leaves the station every day. And if you're ready, you hop on the train, you make, you push your commit. And if you're not ready, you just wait till the next train. And so that way, we, you know, we're iterating every day, we're pushing out code every day. Um, we can actually do it like four times a day. Uh, so it's really nice. Um, typically, we don't do that, but if we need to, we can. And it also forces us to make sure we commit changes that don't break the bill because you're probably going to have to push that day. So you don't want to be that guy that holds up everyone else from leaving the train that day. Another thing we learned is uh, the importance of context. So as an analogy, you know, I work at LinkedIn. If someone tried to describe me and said, oh, hey, Asa, he's the short Asian guy with black hair, that would not be very descriptive, and you, you, they wouldn't be able to point me out. Uh, but if someone was like, oh, he's the guy on the mobile team, you know, he eats a lot, he sits in this area, you suddenly like shrunken down the context, and it's way easier to describe something. So in the same way, we try to make our component context really small so that our function names have some meaning. So if you say this.view and you're in a huge component, that doesn't really say anything. Uh, whereas if you're in a much smaller component, if you say this.view and they don't only a few views, that's a lot easier to kind of figure out. The other big thing we learned is that your front end really has a back end and a front end. So in a sense, we, like our data store, which is doing all the caching and saving the models, um, that's really like our back back end. And then our mid-tier is kind of our actual models, which have lots of business logic in them. And then kind of our front end is like our view models and any of our views we have. And so you know, it's, it's very important to kind of realize that what you have showing you the user might not be the source of truth at that time. And so, you make some assumptions thinking everything is always just one flattened object you can run into problems. Uh, the other thing is that uh, code is really a form of communication. And this is super important. Um, we've improved our documentation a lot, uh, but you know, we've come, come a long way. And so when you don't have a lot of documentation, like, writ like written in a separate repo, not just code documentation, it's very important that your code is very concise uh, and direct. So I think we talked a little bit earlier about the problems that you can have from data binding. And would you use data binding in, in some areas? So we, you know, we bind models around and, and do some cool things. We found that's really useful in small contexts, but once you blow that up to several components, you run into problems. So it's really hard to be concise and explicit when you have view bindings or model bindings floating around. We found that a delegation and actually directly calling functions is, is really helpful for readability sake. So I think somebody talked earlier about a dependency injection earlier, I think Sam it was. So we do a lot of that. We do a lot of uh, our word can passing in the parent object so that we can call the parent object directly instead of uh, bubbling up the view. Another really helpful thing uh, was that we used a module pattern. Um, this, some people this is kind of obvious, but um, you know, it took us a long time to get, actually get to the point where we could do this. You know, everybody agrees that modular patterns are good. It's whether or not you want to put the effort to refactor your system if you don't have it already. And so we actually converted our code base to AMD in a step-by-step -step process. So um, at, at one point, we had only half of our modules in AMD, and the other half were just global variables. Um, and so it was, it was a really interesting process to build a shim and a setup where you could do that. Um, and it was really helpful because uh, the process wasn't super stressful, so we just kind of we built the shim, and then we kind of converted as we went along. Uh, we weren't in a huge rush. We were able to do things um, slowly. Uh, one motto we have is think slowly, so we try to kind of keep the pace down and, and try to go things in a very small, step-by-step -step way. Um, so yeah, definitely worth it. Um, like we've already talked about, it's really used for testing. Um, it's really good for decoupling. It makes you really think about your couplings. So we had a lot of 
um, circular dependencies for modules that we didn't really know about, and a lot of really nasty, we had a really nasty dependency graph, and we had no way of knowing this until we actually used AMD. So it's super cool to see your code base on, on a dependency graph, like a visual dependency graph for the first time, so I highly encourage that if you have not done that already. So I just want to kind of go over a few few backbone friends that, that we use. So like I talked about earlier, we use Q for our promises. Uh, we also use Fiber for our inheritance. So what Fiber does is if you're extending a class and you have to reference your parent object, you usually have to say you know, base model dot or backbone dot model dot prototype dot apply. So you know, that's not a big deal, but it'd be really nice if you could just say base dot apply. So what Fiber does is it modifies your extended function, so you actually pass it a function instead of an object literal, and that function has an argument which is the base. So you can just say base dot function dot apply, and it's kind of syntactic sugar, but it's super helpful. And it mixes in with Backbone really well, so um, I really recommend using it. And also has some pretty nice mixing functions as well, so check that out. And we also use fast click for a touch event. So if on a mobile device you tap It'll actually wait 300 milliseconds before finding that event to make sure you are not doing a double click or a double tap, rather. So that's cool if you're using double tap, but if you're not using double tap, the way we weren't, it just slows up your app and makes it feel kind of like. And so we want to make our, our mobile web experience feel as much like the native as we could. So you know, fast click is a, is a cool way, it's a polyfill to, to do that. Um, we also use Venus as our test runner. So Venus has an open source project LinkedIn started and um, has some, some cool um, abilities so you can easily run your tests in different browsers on Selenium, Grid, Node, whatever. Um, check that out, it's pretty cool. And like I said earlier, we use AMD for our module pattern. And we don't actually, uh, AMD is really just a build step for us. We don't actually asynchronously load um, code except for one final bundle. And so we just use that to like build our dependency. Kind of the basic gist of this is that you really have to pick your toolkit carefully, um, and you definitely want to pick a single tool to do something. Um, so yeah, no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, we're really big on taking, finding open source projects that can solve problems that have already been solved. Um, so just kind of to start to wrap up, um, concepts uh, that we learned are really helpful uh, for being tagging taking control of your backbone repo. Uh, like I said, have tools, single tools for common problems. Um, make sure your component toolbox as well as your your, uh, your 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 library toolbox is is what fits you. So again, you shouldn't have the problem of not knowing where something belongs. And then just the general concept that small is good and big is bad. So you want to try to keep things as small as possible, as incremental as possible, and move slowly. And then as far as keeping your code clean and doing things the same way. Um, make sure that you have a set plan for how you want to extend your code. So make sure there's you know, one way to extend something and, and make extension easy and document it. So that everybody knows how to expand on code. And use a matter of module pattern. So pick something that, that works best for you. Um, I definitely uh, enjoyed hearing about uh, XM6 modules. It seems really cool. Um, some people use require. Uh, we actually have a, a product called inject we use to do AMD. It out. Yeah, and uh, before I end it, I want to give a special thanks to Ryan Blunden. Uh, he's here right now. Ryan, just stand up for a second. Uh, if you have uh, question, other questions after the presentation, feel free to come talk to me or Ryan. So Ryan, Ryan did a lot of help to help me put this together. He's been a big mentor of mine. And also Jacob Huger, another LinkedIn guy. Um, he's the, uh, the main maintainer of Inject. Super cool guy. Definitely tweet at him and talk to me if you have other questions as well. Uh, and yeah, uh, so my Twitter handle is my GitHub. This presentation will be on GitHub later. Uh, this deck is actually a, a mini backbone app that kind of shows the concepts, some of the concepts I talked about. And so you'll be, you can be, feel free to check that out and play around with it from a code standpoint as well as checking out the slides. Uh, yeah, so that's it. Uh, any questions?
what does Q give you over just using jQuery to fill objects, for example? So one of the reasons you use Q is at some point, this might be fixed by now, but jQuery had a, a couple of tests failing in uh, IE. So I don't know what the deal with that is. Um, it might not be an issue anymore. Uh, for either reason we, we picked Q is because we really liked how Q handled uh, debugging. So it had, you can turn on um, uh, long stack traces. And jQuery might have that right now. Um, I'm not too familiar. But at the time, I don't think it did. So it's, it's really helpful for uh, debugging. And then also, we just kind of liked all, all the different helper methods Q has. So Q has a really cool uh, method for you know, if you have a synchronous function and you want to easily return a promise, you don't have to like go through and like create a for it. It's like one function you can return. Um, and it's basically just helper methods and the tests for passing. Um, but yeah, I mean, we we use we actually use jQuery to first first in some of the other projects and we like it, so it's definitely um, a good option. I have a question. <coughs> does um does Q support pipe and all the other stuff? Is that part of this this back kick plus back promises? Pipe. Uh, I'm not sure about what that does. If somebody's more familiar with that, pipe's not this back. Okay. It's okay. Not it's, it's not standard. Oh, uh, one thing I forgot, man. Uh, I got uh, some swag. So if you answer the, or if you ask a question, you get a T-shirt. <laughs> I've got. Uh, if, you want, if you want it, you want you want a, you want a shirt? All right. <laughs> We got a, a large, extra large, and a medium. So uh, you can come back, come by after, and grab your shirt. Uh, first guy to answer the question, you too. I got four, so yeah. Uh, how do you test uh, request limitation on mobile web? How do you know what, when uh, there's uh, too many requests? Too many requests. Um, so I guess like too many is kind of objective. Um, we try to make as basically as few requests as physically possible. So we have one CSS request, actually, I said two, not good, but we have one very small number of CSS requests. We have um, two JavaScript requests. We have the initial JavaScript request for that page, and then asynchronously load one more. Um, so there's, there's only one small place where I think where we do any kind of like repeated requests. Um, and I can't remember what the, the, the amount, that like the frequency of that is. Um, we didn't do any like super scientific thing uh, besides just kind of look at the uh, like dev tools and saw what the uh, response was. Somebody posted a really, a really good blog post somebody talked about in their presentations about like why mobile is so slow. Uh, and there's that one I think is most, more focused on CPU, but another one I can't remember where um, they're just talking about the, the disparity between if you're on a wireless network and on a 4G network, or on like, like a really slow network. And so uh, I don't really have any good answer besides just as few as possible. And we generally found that we actually made like some slight feature changes to like rein in the amount of requests being made. So I think it's a good idea to try to push back on any product changes that might require that, just because the user experience is super important. and. Um, I think most users care that they can use the core features well and not have a huge set of features that are super slow. And so, the best answer I have. I hope that helps. Next question gets the last t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Acceptable questions include how good will I look in this t-shirt? <laughs> 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 You mentioned earlier that you don't do any branching and merging. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Um, so, actually, yeah. So I lied. We have we generally have uh, <laughs> we generally have two branches. So we have like when we were when we went from like the 2011 version to the uh, the 2013 version, uh, we had we just had two branches. We had like the old branch, and then we had like the new, what we were developing on. So I should say we only have one branch under active development at any one time. And so we don't do like feature branches. So we don't have like two guys go off and work on this branch and two guys go off and work on this branch. We just have one branch. So when you commit, and when you commit and push, you are changing whatever what else is changing. So, and we still have to merge sometimes as far as um, 
I should say, we do not have to merge branches. So you still have to merge sometime if you happen to, like, your commit happens to conflict. But we, we don't, yeah, we don't branch off the new features. Does that, that answer your question? Yeah. One more. Are you using Git internally? So the mobile team uses Git. Um, we have a lot of legacy code that's still on SVN. But yeah, we okay, run, run Git. Um, well, how do you manage analytics in mobile space? Well, OK, good question. So we have our own analytics setup. Uh, so it, I was talking a little about page controllers, and this page controller really helped us. So you know, we fire metrics whenever you click a button to go to a page. And we fire another metric when you actually hit that page. Um, you know, Big Brother is definitely watching when you use our app. So every tap, swipe, all that we know about. Um, so yeah, we have a, we actually, we did a lot of refactoring for this. So it was like metrics is probably the biggest pain in the rear for us right now as far as developing. So we have a very really custom setup. And um, we handle that multiple ways, which another you know, thing I've talked about is really good to do that one way. And so um, we have some situations where it's in the markup. So you have a, a button you tap. There's a, in the markup, you specify some, some kind of metric. And sometimes that's handled. Uh, we really extended the crap out of view. So um, all the view handlers actually automatically handle that for you, or most of them do. So any view callback, it'll, under the hood, it'll fire a metric for that. Um, so yeah, you have your own custom setup. If you make your own custom setup, definitely work a lot on the API and make sure there's like one way to do things. Um, and I think it also helps if you have, you build your metric system, at least when you have an idea of how your app will work. Because we added some features after, we added some like, some different control flow mechanisms after we did our metric system. And so we kind of had to hack on stuff after and that was kind of painful. And let's give it one more time for Asa.